I'm Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at Emergence Church, and we are glad that you are tuning in to join or check out one of our worship services. Uh, this is a service from our Thursday night service, and our hope is that it's an encouragement to your faith. We also hope if you're not plugged into a local church that that would be a priority. Church is a, a huge gift from God to us, and while we can have things to resource our discipleship like online services, they're never a replacement for actually joining and committing to a local church. If you are in New Jersey, we'd love to have you come check us out one Thursday night or one Sunday morning at any of our services in any of our locations, and you can find that online. And now um, it is uh, a hope that you would be blessed by this service. In Psalm 62, uh, starting verse 5, it says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He is my only rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock. My refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is is a refuge for us. No matter what you're walking through, uh, God is a refuge. He is the one that makes all things new. Sing, sing, the Lord is our deliverer, and his 
Thank you that you do bring hope to our hearts, hope to our lives. God, we recognize that, that in the middle of the darkness, in the darkest seasons of our lives, God, when it seems like all hope is lost, we thank you that, that you are still there. You are still God. You are still in control. God, and I pray that, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that you would uh, let hope arise in our hearts in those moments. God, that we would recognize that we have a Savior, that we have a God who loves and cares for and watches over us, God. God, may we put our faith fully and our faith, our trust fully in you, God. Whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, God. We worship you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's good to be able to worship together tonight. Uh, and or if you're joining us online this morning, that's weird. It's tonight, but it's in the morning anyway. I already messed up the illusion that it's not Thursday night. Uh, anyway, uh, we're glad that you're here tonight, and uh, we just want to welcome you. Uh, we worship if you're a guest here. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, we worship in a few different ways every week as we gather. We worship through singing songs together. We will, we worship through. Um, Opening God's word, reading scripture, hearing uh, God's word proclaimed, uh, and we worship through being generous. We believe that that's a, a, a calling that God's placed on each of us as believers to be generous uh, with our time, our talents, with our resources, and, uh, and we partner together to do that. Uh, we don't pass a plate or anything. There's a, a, a box in the back, but most of us give online. Uh, but if you're a guest with us, we're just glad that you're here. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions about our church, uh, there's a connect desk, and there's people with blue sweatshirts on that says, how can I help you? Be, uh, be sure to uh, ask any questions that you have and, uh, about how to get plugged into uh, community groups or, or anything that's going on in the life of the church. Uh, but before you're seated, would you take a moment to greet those around you, and then you can have a seat. And here's everything you need to know about what's happening at Emergence. It's turkey time. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Far more than just for turkeys, we have a ton to be thankful for. And this week gives us an opportunity. 
to be reminded of it in a special way. Hope you have a great Thanksgiving with your family and friends. Just a quick reminder, we are not gonna gather on Thursday this week because we're gathering for Thanksgiving, but we'll be back for a big weekend starting November 30th because that weekend is our first give weekend for the first initiative. That's right, that's the first time we will give toward fulfilling our first commitments. And in some ways, it's officially the launch of this season of expanding the work of the church. So mark your calendars for that weekend, Thursday, November 30th and Sunday, December 3rd. Then a week after that, starting December 10th, it's Caroling Week! Woo! Warm up those voices and get ready to hit the streets with the hope of Jesus. Most of us will be heading out with our community groups in a time that you work out together. But if you can't make that time, or if you're not in a group yet, or even if you're just a caroling fanatic and want to double dip, <laughs> you can join in with others on Sunday, December 10th at noon in Ringwood or 5 p.m. in Totowa. I'll be caroling all week. Let's go. <laughs> also that week, we're kicking off another season of winter sessions. Sessions are classes that are open to anyone that meet between community group seasons. This winter, we're taking those six weeks and looking at six topics found throughout all of scripture and how they find their fulfillment in Jesus. The temple, grace, rest, how people change, the people of God, and Christ the King. Sessions meet on Monday nights starting December 11th at 7 p.m. in Suite 500 in Totowa. You don't have to sign up, just come out. And finally, as we mentioned last week, we're gathering together to celebrate the birth of Jesus on Christmas Eve, Eve this year. And we have details for you. Services will be on Saturday, December 23rd in Totowa at 3, 4.15, 5.30, and 6.45, and in Ringwood at 3, 4.30, and 6. There's seven services to choose from, but don't just pick your preferred time. Pick one that works for someone that you want to introduce to the gospel and bring them along. By God's grace, this Christmas will be a celebration of Jesus' life and new life in someone you love through Jesus. As always, you can get any info you may have missed from this week's news on the digital bulletin. You can use the QR code in the chair in front of you to get there, and that's all we got this week. Let's keep loving Jesus, loving people, and plowing a counterculture. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everyone. See ya. You're not what you feel. You're not what you've done. You're not all these failures. You are my son. You're not what you feel. You're not what you've done. It doesn't define you. You are my son All right, great to be with you. Um, our creative team did an incredible job putting together the, the bumper, and I feel like, yeah, we're, I'm good, man. That thing is incredible. Uh, just super powerful, you know, to, to, to hear the lyrics and see um, God's love through this account in Luke 15 that we're in. Hey, uh, before we jump into Luke 15 together, just want to say in two weeks, you heard it on the news video, but next week's Thanksgiving, we're not going to have a Thursday night service. Uh, we're going to be back the following week. That week is what we're calling First Give. We've been talking about First a lot over the last couple of weeks. That's where the generosity of First will begin. And just want to say, I know some of you guys were out of town. I was out of town last week, and you're saying, I, I, I want to make that commitment. If you didn't get to be part of Commitment Sunday, it was super powerful, and it was really awesome to see how the congregation responded, how God moved. If you weren't able to put a commitment card in, you still would like to take that step. You can put one in the boxes in the back if you have your card. If not, there's a card in the seat back in front of you. You can grab that. And we're saying as a church, we believe that God has given us His first and best in Christ. And we're asking the question, what's it look like for us to say in this season of sacrifice and generosity to advance the work of God, what's our first and best look like? And so that's going to be in two weeks from now. Uh, first Give, super excited. We're going to talk about the, the results that have come in and share where we're going and the and next steps. And so should be a big celebration. But tonight, uh, we're going to continue in Luke chapter 15. It's an incredible, incredible chapter. Uh, it, we're looking at one of the parables that Jesus tells, but he actually tells three parables in this account uh, that that launch into the last one we're looking at. He's got an audience around him that are questioning what he's doing, hanging out with sinners, and Jesus starts to tell a couple different parables, and he gets to the last one, the one that takes up most of Luke chapter 15, as he deals with the account of what many people call the prodigal son. Steve did an awesome job last week talking about the first half of that parable, where we see there's a father, and it's representative of God and God's heart, and, and he has two sons. 
And what we saw last week is the younger son essentially goes up to his father and says, give me my share of the inheritance, which is basically like saying, dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my money, right? I don't, I don't want you, but I do want your stuff. Now, you have to remember, that's a shame, honor culture. So as offensive as that is for us, okay, to hear that, I don't want you, I want your stuff, I wish you were dead, as offensive as that is for us, in that culture, it's horrifying. So the people listening, they do not like that son. Like, he's not a good guy. And to make it worse, it's not like he takes the resources his father gives. Because it's a shock, right? The father liquidates. He gives him the resources. He's like, there you go. What, what's, what's shocking is he doesn't do anything good with it. It's not like he goes, you know, all Warren Buffett and he invests it wisely and, and gets a great return on it. No, he, he parties like a rock star. You know, he goes out, he blows his money on partying and prostitutes. He's like a child Disney actor gone wrong. That's what he's like. He just goes crazy, parties, gets drunk, blows his money on prostitutes. Finally, he's out of money, and he's hired himself out uh, feeding pigs, and this beautiful picture of repentance, actually, in, in the Scripture, where as he's eating the, the pods of the pigs, he decides, not only have I sinned against my father, uh, but I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against my father. And he says, maybe my father's actually so kind and so merciful that he'd take me back as a servant. And as he's on his way back, and this is, Steve did such a good job about talking about this, um, we see just kind of the reckless heart love of God the Father in the parable. The father, to his own shame, runs out, grabs the son, uh, kisses him, hugs him, says, get a robe, get a ring, let's kill the fattened calf, let's have a giant party. This son of mine was lost, and now he's found. He was dead, now he's alive. Let's go and celebrate. And it's beautiful. It's a jarring, beautiful picture of the gospel. There was not a misty eye in the place. Certainly Steve's eyes weren't misty. Steve literally uh, in the office. Steve, when he said it wrecked him, he was not exaggerating. For four days straight, Steve cried. And, but that, listen, if you're going to cry about something, cry about the gospel. Like it's worth crying about. And it's, it's, beautiful. it's a beautiful picture of the gospel. And yet what's amazing as touching as it was, because it is, it's, it's strikingly beautiful to see the heart of God the Father. The original audience that heard it would not have been misty-eyed. Uh, they were furious. And today we're going to see why they were furious, because actually what Steve shared last week is only the first half of the, of the account, and it, it's only setting up Jesus' main point. And today, Jesus is going to take the focus off the younger brother, and he's going to put the focus on the older brother, and he's going to go, this, this is why I'm telling you this. This is what I've been building towards. And the more he goes on, on this account, actually, the more furious the group listening to him is going to get as Jesus goes and unpacks the rest of this incredible account as he gets to the climax of this Luke 15. Look what he says. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. So, so picture the scene, right? Father, you know, son comes home. There's a huge party going in. The older brother's working the field. He's heading back in probably from the end of the day. And as he's getting close to the house, there's a party. And this isn't, this isn't lame. This is fattened calf was wedding celebration level. Okay, that, that's what we're talking about. This is great expense. This is maybe a few times in life, this type of party. And as he's heading home, as he's heading back in, he sees his father's throwing a crazy party. And so he asks the servant, what's going on? And the servant tells him, hey, your, your brother came home. He, he was lost and found. He's de dead and alive. And look at the language of the text. The older brother hears that, and he's furious. He, he's so angry that he refuses to go into the house. 
and look at what happens. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. So once again, we see there's a father going out after his son. This, this time it's the older son. And he comes out to meet him. He says, hey, come into the party. Your brother's home. He's lost and was found. He's dead in his life. Come into the celebration. And instantly, the older brother's going to snap back at him. Look what he says. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? He's furious. He's going, what, what are you doing? Like, all these years, I've been faithful to you. And I never even got a goat, which is always fun to read, you know, because like, that's not a common complaint of, of most people in modern culture. And, and right away, we see some pretty interesting things about the older son's heart, right? Because even though the older son's never gone very far, it becomes clear really quick, he does not have the heart of the father. The older son does not truly love what the Father loves. And we, and we get a couple real interesting details about what's going on in that older son th that I think show us a lot about a heart that is far from the heart of the Father. The first, notice the language. He says, all these years I've been serving, for, serving you. The, the language is really interesting. It's all these years I've been slaving for you. That I, I've been out and I've slaved for you. I've done everything you said, and I did it perfectly. And yet, notice this about the Son. For him, obedience to the Father is misery and slavery. It's not freedom. And actually, it's really striking. The more he serves, the more bitter he's becoming. See, see you know you've lost the heart of the Father, that as you serve God and as you walk with Him, that service is not filling you with joy, and that service is not filling you with freedom. That service is actually filling you with increasing anger and bitterness. I love how Helmut Tickel says it. He says, what a wretched thing it is to call oneself a Christian and yet be a stranger and a grumbling servant in the Father's house. Think about how that heart contrasts the heart of David or the heart of the psalmist. Right? I, I love in Psalm 1 when the psalmist is talking about what the blessed man looks like. That, that word blessed in Psalm 1 is happy, what the happy man looks like. And look what he says, "'Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked,' nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You see the contrast? The, the older son, he's, he's, sir, he's doing everything the father says, but he's miserable, and he's growing increasingly bitter, and he sees uh, obedience to the father as slavery. But the psalmist says, actually, the more you serve God, the more you delight in his word the more you actually taste and see that he's good. If something happens when you have the heart of God, when you, God's changed your heart, you go out and you serve, and over time, what, what's the experience most Christians have? They go, I actually like serving God. I like walking with him. I like that I don't live with regret from the, from the sins I've committed. I like that I'm not enslaved. I like that I'm not addicted. I like that God's given me a spiritual gift and I'm growing in it. I like that God's using my life to bless others. I actually like that there's fruit in my life. I like the person God's making me. And what happens is, as you walk with God, when God changes your heart and you're his child, you, you go, I actually love walking with God. I love his word. I love what he asked me to do. I love when I get to serve him. I love that he uses me. And one of the marks you may actually not be a Christian is you're constantly around the things of God, but you find them kind of enslaving and limiting and boring. And sure, you'll go to church, but you just don't really like the things that God asked you to do. 
When a true son over time, as he begins to walk with God, goes, I actually like who God's making me. And it's striking because not only is that his complaint where he sees obedience to the Father as slavery, not as freedom, but he begins to complain. And I'll tell you this, you can learn a lot about someone's idols when you hear their complaints. Really interesting. You can learn a lot about people's expectations. Um, You can learn a lot about what they think they're entitled to when you listen to their complaints. Because what's the complaint? When this son of yours... And isn't that striking? He can't even call him his brother. He's become those people. Those bad people. When this son of yours, it's not my brother, comes home, you killed a fattened calf for him. And you never even once gave me a goat. Which, which remember, what's, what's the younger son's original statement? Give me my inheritance. I don't want you. I just want your stuff. Well, what's the older son saying? I don't want relationship with you. I find the things you're asking me to do slavery. I just want your stuff. And you've never even given it to me. I don't want you. I want your stuff. Their, their hearts, it expresses itself differently but the heart of the sons is the same. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, you know, I, I think this is a guess, right? But we're, we're emergence church. You know, we're a church plant. We, we live in the younger brother world, right? Like, that's our thing, you know? We got an addictions ministry. It's huge, right? Like, we don't have a lot of people showing up in suits like old, older brother stuff, Okay. But, but their hearts aren't far from each other, and I think we'll all find parts of our lives in the older brother. It's amazing how quickly we can become older brothers, right? And, and what's interesting, the younger brother believes this. The younger brother truly believes that freedom's found when I can throw off the bondage of my father, Right, as soon as I could just get rid of the, the expectation of the father, um, the requirements, as soon as I'm outside the house, then there's freedom. And there's a lot of people who believe this. There's a lot of psychologists. This is their belief. Hey, you live with this religious guilt, and the only way you're ever going to truly be free is when you can throw off that pressure of God the Father. Right? And people feel this. They feel like, I'll never truly be free until I can throw off God's expectations of me or standards of holiness uh, on, on my life or my sexuality or my, the way I love my spouse or my saving. Like, like God has demands because he's God. He says, this is what it looks like to walk with me. And the lie they believe is, well, I'll be free when I throw that off. And, and yet here's, here's the, the tragedy of that. Life, freedom, and joy is only found in surrendering to God. Like, it's, it's almost like you're saying, uh, I'll find, I don't like being bound by breathing. It's so enslaving. So I need to be free by throwing off air. What's going to happen? You're going to die. Yeah, I, I'm a little nervous we're there already, but um, you're going to die if you don't breathe, okay? But here's, here's the thing. In the same way, if you try to find freedom by throwing off God, by saying, hey, the, the, the obligations, the bondage, you're never going to find it. And there's a lot of people, like the younger brother, who feel like freedom's outside the, the bondage of God. Um, the older brother, what he believes is he can serve and he can obey and, and obey and he can be so good in such a way that he can put the Father in his bondage. That Ultimately, he's saying, I can live in such a way where I bind God, and now he has to serve me. And this is where if you go down this road, you will get bitter and you'll get frustrated. This is where people say things like, I don't get it. I was good. And why am I single? Like, I went to church every week. Why are my kids rebellious? I, I served and I showed up and everyone else didn't. And why am I going through this? Why is my sister who barely walks with the Lord, why does she always get the promotion? Sometimes it's really serious, right? Like we were faithful. Why do, why do we get the cancer diagnosis? 
And what the older brother believes is I live in such a way where the Father owes me. And when we live like that, we'll always miss the gospel. Because the gospel is whether we're an older or a younger brother, we all come in solely by grace. Solely by the mercy of God. And every single breath we take this side of heaven is a gift to us and is love for us. And we can't ever put him in our debt. We can't ever bind him up where he has to serve us. And what he believes is the lie that somehow he's been good and the Father owes him. And that really leads to the, to the most striking thing of all, really, in the parable, is what we find is the older brother is also lost. That the father is going outside his house to seek him. In fact, look, look, at, the, look at the passage because it's so striking. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing and called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said, your brothers come home. Your father's killed the fat calf because he's received them back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to come in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you and I never disobeyed your command and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes came home, you killed the fat calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive he was lost and is found. And here's the jarring thing. And th this is the thing that really is going to start to make the audience furious. Because not only do we see it that the older brother's lost, but actually, here's the thing about what I, what I would call older brother lostness. He's actually more lost. And the parable ends, and where's the older brother? He's outside the party. The parable ends, and we're not sure if he's still lost. See, see the thing about younger brother lostness is when you think freedom's in throwing off the bondage of God and going out and just doing whatever you want, whether it's partying or whatever, however that is, it doesn't take long till you're like, this is bad. Right? Like when we have younger brother lostness, we're not confused. Like he's sleeping with prostitutes. I'm pretty sure he doesn't wake up and be like, is that, is that okay? Like he knows. Like by the time you've made it to prostitutes, life's gone wrong. You know, we, we, we do. We, we, we get to serve a lot of people who, who struggle with addiction. Um, the people who are struggling with heroin addiction, they're not going, was that okay? They're like, no, no, this is wrong. They're not waking up like, I'm going to knock it out of the park today, crush some goals, listen to a little Jocko, Disciplines, Freedom, and oh, I shot Aaron, is that our? No, it's like, I, I know I'm lost. And one of the, the beauties sometimes of, of being a younger brother in lostness is it doesn't take long till you're like, yeah, I'm lost. See, the hard part of being older brother lostness is you don't hear a lot of people say, pray for me. I'm becoming more bitter. Pray for me. I'm not delighting in the Word of God, but I find it a duty and a service. Pray for me. I'm having a hard time not labeling certain groups of people those people. Right? Pray for me. I'm becoming bitter and callous and resentful and judgmental. And it's easy to be around the Father's house and still completely miss the Father's heart. And it's revealed you've lost God's heart because you're lost. And you look far more like a servant 
than a son. Now remember, the original audience who hears this, they're, they're furious. Right? Why, why do we have the account of the prodigal son? Remember how Luke 15 starts. There's a group of people that start to gather around Jesus. And, and some of them are notorious sinners. Look, look how Luke 15 starts. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So the Pharisees come and they see Jesus is eating with all these crazy sinners. And they're like, what's going on? How could this be any good if he's eating with those people? To which, and Jesus is just such a master, right? What's he do? He, anytime Jesus does this to the Pharisees, he's getting ready to just, just, just crush them. He just starts telling stories. That's why we have Luke 15. They're like, hey, you eat with sinners. What's wrong with you? Jesus is like, story time. Here's story one. There's a shepherd. He's got 100 sheep. One gets lost. The good shepherd goes and finds that lost sheep, takes him back to the sheep pen. What's he do when he finds him and gets home? He calls his neighbors and friends and says, my sheep was lost and it's found. And he throws a party. And then Jesus interjects. He gives the moral of the story because he knows we're going to miss it unless he really helps us. He goes, here's the thing. Heaven rejoices far more over one sinner who repents. The angels rejoice far more over one sinner that repents. Story two, there's a lady. She's got a lost coin. You know what she does? She rips the house apart to find it. She finds it. Guess what she does? She calls her friends. She says, I found my coin. Come and celebrate with me. She throws a party. And Jesus interjects again. Heaven rejoices. The Son of God and the angels rejoice when one who's lost is found. Then we get to our story. There's a son. He gets lost. What's the expectation? When is the older brother going to be like that good shepherd and go find his lost brother? When's he going to tear the place apart like the lady did with that coin to go find his lost brother? When's he going to do all he can so he can bring the, the son home and they can have a big party? And what? He never does. In fact, he gets more furious. And finally, that son comes to his senses. He repents. He comes home. The father forgives him. And then he's furious he came home. Do you see what Jesus is doing? You guys are mad because I'm eating with sinners and tax collectors. You're the very people who have my word and know my truth and are supposed to be the people tearing the place apart to find those sinners and tax collectors. You should be fired up that the lost are coming to find God and to be found, and instead you're furious. You know why? Because you don't have the Father's heart. And then it ends. And the older brother's outside the house. See what he's saying? You're around and you find the things of God a burden and you think you can trap God and you look down on people and you don't search for them. You don't seek them because you don't truly love what God loves. God loves his lost sons and lost daughters. And we should be the people who are doing all we can to find them and throwing the party. The great news of the whole Bible is that Jesus is God's true son. That when we got lost, he didn't just sit in the house. He left the comforts of heaven. He left the inheritance. He came, and next year we're going to study the Gospel of John. 
You know what we see all over the Gospel of John? Jesus only does the will of God. He delights to do the will of the Father. In fact, even in the hardest moment, as he's sweating drops of blood, and he's going, if there's any other way, God, but what? Not my will, but your will be done. And then the true Son of God goes to the cross. He's lost so that we could be found. And he rises and he brings us into an inheritance that does not spoil or fade if we will be the lost sinners who repent. And the Bible says when that happens, all of heaven rejoices. Whether you are a, a younger son running as far away from God or whether you're a moralist and you think those people could never be saved, if you're willing to repent, God the Father places his robe on you and says, this is my son. Because Jesus was the true son of God. Jesus came and Jesus was faithful and Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's the heart of God. And you know you have the heart of God when you delight to seek and save the lost. And one of my prayers as we move into this Christmas season is let's be a church that this Christmas season that lets heaven party. Because we're actually caring about those who don't know Jesus. Whether they're religious or whether they're wild. But let's be the church that seeks them with boldness. I love, I love that so many people in this church, they're just, they're just doing it, right? So like last year, we're like, okay, we're going to go caroling. It's Christmas season. People need music. And like, I was like, I was so convicted, okay? I'm just going to share totally honestly before we did the huddle. And they're like, hey, raise your hand if you went caroling last year. And I was like, oh, man, this is, this is awkward, but i got to be honest. Everyone around me is like, that was awesome. I was like, I'm, I missed it. Son was sick or something. Um, those who did it, they're like so many stories of like, I don't know, it's crazy. I'm just doing it because like God loves the lost. And so many people were like, people were so thankful. People wanted to come. I'm so glad as a church, I, I feel like this a lot. I feel like we've come out of our junior high years. You know, when you're junior high, everyone's like so concerned how everything looks. It's like, I just don't care how it looks anymore. Hell's hot, hell's forever. Too many people in North Jersey don't know them. And I just want to do all we can, whether it's caroling or whatever, to have an opportunity to say, hey, God loves you. And, and give them a card to Christmas Eve Eve. The reason we do Christmas Eve Eve and not Christmas Eve as a church, we've always done the 23rd. The reason we do that is because we want to give people an opportunity who, who, don't, who, go, who go to church twice a year, like Christmas Eve and Easter. Like those folks who you invite them and they want to come to church with me on Christmas Eve. They're like, nah, man, I, I got Christmas Eve. You're like, you go to church? Uh, yeah, Christmas, every Christmas Eve. We light a candle and then we come back on Easter. Um, our hope... <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what, our hope is you can say to them, well, come out on the, on the 23rd. And if you want, I'll, I'll go to your candle church on the 24th. <laughs> but like, you know, we'll, we can't do candles here because the fire code. So, you know, we'll tap each other's cell phone and light of the world. But it's not the point. The point is there are people who don't know Jesus. And so we want to do, I hope some of you guys have a great Christmas party at your house. And invite your neighbors and invite your coworkers. And you know, you don't have to sit down and do like a manger scene in the middle, but you can at the end of like it'll be like, all right, you know, you're the wise man and you're Herod. Like, um, you don't need to do that. But what would be awesome is at the end of it, after everyone had a fun time, give them a card. Say, come and see. Here's the thing. I hope as we head in this, into this season there's something that you're going to do because the heart of God is to seek and save the lost. The things of God are life. 
Jesus was the ultimate son who came and lived and did God's will and delighted in it so that when we were lost, we could be found and become God's sons and daughters. Now this Christmas season, let's be like him. Let's pray, God, I want to do something for you in this season to help those who don't know you see you. Use me in that. Let, let me pray for us that, that we would. God, we are um, just thankful for this in, incredible parable that, that Jesus tells to um, confront how we can so easily slide into a, a judgmentalism and um, a, a bitterness and, and somewhere along the way, uh, especially if we've been at this for some time, uh, we, we can lose your heart, your heart that is to seek and save the lost. And God, I'm so grateful for when that happens. We can open the scriptures and we can look at Jesus and we can see what he's doing, who he's ministering to, um, who he is allowing to come around him. God, would we be people who, like Jesus, maybe get accused of being friends of sinners by religious people? And, and God, maybe even for some of us, that means being friends of religious people. But God, would you give us your heart that knows your sons and daughters, so many of them are lost. And would we not be like the older brother who's just going through the motions bitterly trying to entrap you? Would we be like Christ who laid aside his comforts to seek those who don't know you? And God, I, I pray for those even for the first time today who might realize how good Jesus has been to them, that they would surrender, that they would repent, that heaven would rejoice because they say, God, I surrender. I'm so sorry for thinking life was found outside of you. How foolish. Or joy or freedom or meaning or purpose could somehow be found outside of God. God, forgive me for that. Forgive my sin. Thank you that what Christ did was enough. God, I surrender my life to you. You're the one who created it. I want to use it for you. And then, God, let us be a church this Christmas season that you give us creativity and courage. Whether it's Monday at work to simply say, hey, I'm, I'm going to church on the 23rd and, or tomorrow at work. <laughs> um, we pray you'd use us, God. We ask all of that, Lord, uh, for your glory, for our joy, and the good of those all around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and worship with us? I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus
heavens Let the praise go up as the walls come down All creation, everything with breath Repeat the sound All his children, clean hands, pure hearts Good grace, good God, his name is Jesus Good, good evangelism it can be demystified by just having conversations, by just connecting, by just trying to pray for someone. And then, God, um, you take those seeds and you use them, so help us to be faithful with them. We ask all that, God, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you need prayer for anything, there's a prayer team over there. They'd love to pray for you and hope you guys have a great week.